whenever Father makes the lunch break. I don't think okay. we'll start. <laughs> I, I don't think we're going to start anyway. It's like my dog, she can't find a rib. Yeah. So, but we'll take care of that. And there is no cost to this retreat. If anyone wants to give a, a free will donation at the end, then please do so and it will defray the expenses. Other than that, no other commercials. <laughs> We're blessed to have Father. Go ahead, Father. Thank you. Uh, we are recording this, so please behave. Okay. <laughs> I know it's hard for all of you, <laughs> but it's very good to be here with all of you uh, today. It's a beautiful day in Las Vegas. We're having unusually warm weather, so absolutely fantastic. And it's good to gather uh, together on a, uh, on a day like this and to talk about our faith and in, uh, in particular way, a great aspect of our faith. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, forgiveness and what a great topic to talk about, particularly because we are in the year of mercy right now. Pope uh, Francis, our current Pope, uh, declared this year as the year of mercy. So uh, until November of this year, we are supposed to be celebrating and internalizing the idea of mercy in our lives, which is kindness, forgiveness, the way God treats us, and in turn, how do we reflect on that in our life so that we can bring that way of living uh, to our family circles, to our church circles, to our work circles, to our friend circles, to the ladies auxiliary circle how do we how do we do that in our own lives and of course that's a need always for a, a constant reflection on the need to continually convert continually change for me to change and to become different to become better to form myself and to mold myself and to allow god to form me and to mold me you know, we are during the time of Lent right now. And during Lent, the church asks us not to eat meat on Fridays. You know that, right? Yes. Well, I am reminded of this uh, one gentleman named John, who he, he lived in a neighborhood with all Catholic folk. So he was, he was the one Baptist that lived in a neighborhood and everybody was Catholic. And you know that happens particularly in the Midwest or in the East Coast where there would be entire neighborhoods where everybody would be Catholic and then all of, sometimes somebody would stand out and in this case John stood out because he was Baptist and so his neighbors were all on him. John, convert, become Catholic. <laughs> become Catholic. Well, John finally relented and uh, went through the process and so they brought him to church and the priest, of course, sprinkled him with holy water and you know what happens at baptism as he got baptized. With, the priest sprinkled him and said, you know, uh, you were born a Baptist you were raised a Baptist, and now you're Catholic. <laughs> you know that happens, right? Three times, okay? Of course, it's a variation. The way we baptize is, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. But the priest had, you know, he did baptize him in that way, of course, to make the baptism valid, but he also said, you know, you were, as he was sprinkling him, you were, born a Baptist, you were raised a Baptist, and now you're Catholic three times. Well, the year had gone by, because you know when we baptize adults, is at the Easter Vigil on Holy Saturday. That's when we bring people into the church. So it's a year-long process. Well, a whole year went by, and the next Lent came about. And what happens during Lent? Fridays are meatless. Well, that's 
it's hard for people who are not Catholic to start keeping Meatless Fridays. And so, remember, the whole neighborhood was Catholic. He, John was the only Baptist or former Baptist. Okay? And so on a Friday, all the neighbors are smelling <laughs> that it, from John's house comes the aroma of steak, beef, and they got all worked up, <gasps> calling each other. John must have forgotten that it's fish that we're supposed to have. Tuna casseroles. <laughs> it's Friday. And so they all ran over to John to let him know, you know, that this is Friday. And as they got there, okay, they saw John standing there with some holy water over the... Over, <laughs> <laughs> over the stake. And he says, you were born a cow. You, <laughs> you were raised a cow. And now you're a fish! <laughs> but you know, one of the ideas for us as, as Catholics is that conversion for us is not an instantaneous experience. It's not like the fact that we have been baptized and all of us have been, that we are baptized, that we are now finished products. No, it's a constant work in progress. So in the Catholic Church, we don't believe in this, oh, I confess with my lips that Jesus is my Lord and there, I'm now a finished product. I'm now a Christian. I now follow uh, in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus and I'm done. No, it doesn't work that way. We constantly have to convert all the time. Conversion is a constant process. It's a lifelong process. It means on a daily basis, I have to get up and see how it is that I should change in my life. This is why, uh, for example, priests and nuns and brothers in the church, uh, we pray something called the Liturgy of the Hours. Uh, which is uh, the church's prayer. It's the official prayer of the church, and we pray that every single day. And uh, at night, we pray something called night prayer. But before you pray the night prayer, you make an a examination of conscience. So you look inside of yourself and you say, what is it during this day that has happened during my day that I should change within me? So it's a constant battle within us to change, to become better. And one of the ways that we can all become better in this life is to practice more mercy. And mercy is understanding. Understanding, so understanding the people around me more. Mercy is patient, so to become more patient with the people in my life. Mercy is kindness, to become more kind to the people around me, more compassionate, the way God treats us. Now, God offers each of us unconditional forgiveness and reminds us of how we should approach each other in this life with also the unconditional forgiveness that God calls us to embody. God never rejects any of His children. And all people are children of God. Not just those who are baptized. Not just those who are Christian. But all people are children of God. And Pope Francis reminds us of that. He said so very famously at the beginning of his pontificate, he said, even atheists are children of God. All people are children of God, whether you are a believer or an unbeliever. Everyone is a child of God, and God never rejects any of his children. God is quick to forgive, the Bible tells us, slow to anger, and full of compassion for all His children. And so, as we gather here today, this morning, we celebrate the love that God showers us with, and we ask ourselves during this time how we treat one another. 
God calls us to show mercy, love, and compassion to those around us. Never to judge people, but to be kind and compassionate. Are we is the reflection for today. Are we? I remember when I was growing up in Chicago, my brother won four goldfish at the annual parish festival. Uh, I moved here to the United States when I was eight years old. Uh, from Poland and we we were part of a Polish neighborhood in Chicago and our parish we had every single year we had an annual festival to raise money for the parish but it was a lot of fun lots of things happened at the annual parish festival and my brother won four, four goldfish the following day we went out shopping for an aquarium because you need an aquarium for goldfish and the prices ranged from 70 to a hundred dollars well we were poor immigrants and there was no way we could afford a new fish tank so I mean we lived in a basement and we just had a couple mattresses that we found in the alley when we moved here uh, very we we didn't have a tv for the first oh, few months and then we found one also in the alley so it's a, the immigrant experience is a very tough experience very tough experience my parents of course didn't speak any english i didn't speak any english my brother didn't speak any english so we li but we lived in like little poland you know everything was polish church was polish stores were polish um, and uh, everybody helped one another. People helped one another. Um, I went to a bilingual school. Uh, the school I went to was Schubert School, elementary school. And it was a, there was a system, I think it's to this day, where uh, recently arrived immigrants from Poland would be uh, in a classroom trying to be integrated uh, and so I was there with all kids who had recently arrived from Poland. Why did my family move here to the United States? Well, for the very same reasons that many immigrants move here. Uh, economic reasons. Uh, we used to always dream about the United States. It was a, uh, particularly because uh, in the early 90s when communism had already ended, in Poland, uh, one of the things that opened up was um, American television, modern American television. You see, in the 80s, when I was very young, uh, we had on television, we had American shows, but it was communism still. And so the only shows they would show you would be Little House on the Prairie or Bonanza or Westerns because they didn't want you to see how Americans lived. But in the early 90s, communism ended in uh, December of 89. And once that happened, we got Dynasty. You remember Dynasty? Uh, so we had dynasty and so the Carringtons if you remember everybody wanted to so there was this idealized version of what America is like and so people wanted to move here and when uh, communism ended the Polish government at the time signed free trade agreements because during communism the Polish market was closed to free trade they only traded with uh, countries that were communist so like uh, the, the only those who were like Cuba was one of them for example so uh, we didn't have many goods that would be available but when communism ended the market opened up and so my parents who worked in a factory the factory collapsed it was a textile factory and the factory collapsed because the Polish market become became inundated with goods from China Mm -hmm. And when the Chinese market took over, <coughs> every, all the factories collapsed. And so my parents were out of work. And so uh, there, we had a choice of where to immigrate, uh, either Germany or the United States. And of course, the, the choice was clear to immigrate to the United States because this is known and it is a place where people from all over come together 
and become one, you know. It's, I don't like this uh, melting pot. I don't like that. Melting, this is not a melting pot. The United States is not a melting pot. We don't all come and melt into something. It's a, I like the version of a salad bowl. <laughs> you know, we all, in a salad bowl, you can still taste all of the ingredients, even though they all work together. You can taste the tomatoes, the salad, the cucumber. You can, all, you can taste everything. Well, in the United States, we come together like that. We don't abandon our background, our identity. We come and we work, we work together within that, and that's what makes the United States so great. And so I was in a bilingual classroom, and in the same, in the same um, school, there were also bilingual classrooms for uh, children, particularly who were coming from uh, Mexico mostly from Mexico, but also from other Latin American countries. And so there were, uh, we had, uh, my, my encounter and, 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 ex and experience with the Latino community and the exposure to other cultures and to that which makes the United States great, that we're all, you know, we're not all the same, we're different, but that's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. I mean, that's, that's what we're about. And also in the church. Isn't it wonderful when we come together in the Catholic Church on Sunday that we're all so different from so many different backgrounds? It's, you know, we have people from Mexico, people from the Philippines, pe people from other Latin American countries, people from Vietnam, people from Africa, people who were born here, people who are poor, people who are rich. And then you look up at the altar and there's a priest from Poland celebrating Mass. <laughs> You know, how, how, absolutely, how absolutely wonderful, you know. And so we celebrate that. We, we rejoice in that. And we all think differently. Some of us are Democrats. Some of us are Republicans. Some of us are liberals. Some of us are conservative. You know, we all have different points of view. And we all come together to celebrate the oneness, the oneness of our faith. That in the Lord we all, even though we are different, we make up one body, one body in Christ. And that's how uh, wonderful it is. So we are proud to, be, proud to be Catholic. If you go to some other churches, you many times won't notice that because people, will, you know, people like to hang around with people who think like them, who look like them. It's, we don't do that. And it's great. And we rejoice in that. Absolutely rejoice in that in the church. And so my family moved to the United States and we were, of course, very poor. And as I was telling you, uh, through the great opportunities that we were given here in the United States, for example, I just, I absolutely rejoice in the fact that I am the first one to graduate college in my whole family. Wow. My grandparents were illiterate, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. couldn't read or write. My parents didn't even finish high school. And me, because of uh, the opportunities here in the, in the United States, I was able to do so much. So we rejoice in that. And as I was telling you about this experience in the parish festival, because our life centered around our parish, uh, that's where we took great comfort from, from our faith. It was our life centered there. And the tanks, the aquariums, I should say, the prices ranged from a, a 70 to $100. But we couldn't afford that. So we went to guess where? Yeah. To the local thrift store. <coughs> I, call them the, I call them the malls of the poor. Aww. Right? Lots of people go to the thrift store and find all sorts of things there. And we spotted a discarded tank <coughs> there, an aquarium, complete with gravel and filter, and it was only $10. What? Sold. <laughs> $10. So we bought it at once, took it home and spent hours washing and cleaning it up until it looked like new. We spent hours washing and cleaning it. Hours. By evening, the four little fish were swimming in their new home. 
They were happy in there. They were happy in their new tank. Well, the following day, we found that one of the fish was dead. <laughs> Too bad, but three remained. We thought to ourselves, well, we still have three. Great. A day later, a second one was dead. Mm -hmm. Well, we thought to ourselves, well, you know, we still have the other ones left over. So, and then by nightfall, the third one had died. So we called the local pet store to investigate. It didn't take long to discover the problem. We had washed the tank with soap. We washed the tank with soap. We washed the aquarium with soap. Something one must never do. <laughs> because the soap affects the fish. In spite of our good intentions, this unenlightened effort destroyed the very lives we sought to protect. So, I'm bringing up to you the immigrant experience for a reason also. Because we are all so very different, all of us. And the United States in many ways reminds us of our church. The salad bowl, not the melting pot. The salad bowl. Everybody different. You don't want, we, you don't want the tomato to become like the cucumber. Everybody's different. You, the salad doesn't become like the artichoke in there. It all just coexists. And every, the tomato accepts the cucumber. That it's different than the cucumber. We don't, the, we don't want the cucumber to become a tomato when you're putting the salad together. We don't do that. Don't work that way. You see, it's, it's the thing within the, in that neighborhood that I was telling you about, the very Catholic neighborhood, and the gentleman who was Baptist, he needs to become Catholic. He needs to be Catholic. There's something wrong. We want him to be like us. We have to do everything for him to be like us. That's not how it works. Oh, but also a reflection in your, in your family lives. You know. Do you want the other people in your family to be like you? Or do you accept them as they are? The tomato accepts the cucumber. You wish for your husband to change, to be molded into what you want him to be, or your children to change, to be as you want them to be, the people around you, your brothers, your sisters, people in church, people in the ladies' auxiliary. Everybody has to change except you, right? You know, that's the attitude so many times. What's my problem in life? My husband needs to change. If only he would change and become different, things would be wonderful in our life. My kids need to change. If only they would change, our life would just be so wonderful. <sighs> you know, all my co-workers, they're the problem. The people in church, they're the problem. The priest needs to change. That's the problem. You know? That's the, that's the problem. The priest needs to change. Oh, the bishop. Or maybe the pope. You know, today, uh, as popular as our Holy Father is, he's un very unpopular with a certain group in the church who don't like him. Really? Because he challenges people. He challenges people the way they are. And people don't like him. So, what is your attitude in your life? Is it that everybody else around you needs to change? Or no, what about today, you know? Uh, the government needs to change. Yeah. Every, you know, 
We have to be the change that we wish to see. And, and our attitude, if we are to be like Jesus Christ, and we are supposed to be like Jesus Christ, we are supposed to be striving to be like Jesus Christ, is that I am the one that's in need of change. I need to change. And in that I bring mercy, kindness, compassion, forgiveness into my home. Rather than seeking others to change, I seek my own conversion. It's not my neighbor who's the Baptist that needs to become better and needs to become like me because I'm Catholic. I need to become better. I need to become better, not someone else. It's not my neighbor that needs to change. It's I that need to change. That's the change we seek. You see, sometimes we as Christians, we act exactly in the way that we acted with the fish tank. We had very good intentions in cleaning the, the tank with soap. We had great intentions, did we not? Mm -hmm. Great intentions. Did, did the, the neighbors, the Catholic neighbors, in trying to convert the man who was Baptist, did they have bad intentions? No. They had great intentions. But that, his heart wasn't in there. His heart wasn't there. His heart wasn't in it. You can have great intentions and sometimes in our zeal to clean up the lives of others. We use killer soaps. Mm -hmm. Killer soaps. Criticism. We love to critique people, you know. Condemnation. So much condemnation all around. Pointing fingers. You know, whenever you're you're pointing one finger, you've got, see, how many do you have pointing right back at you? You know, when you're pointing this finger, you've got three pointing right back at you. Mm. Anger and exclusion. We've been very good in the church throughout the centuries at excluding people. Telling people who's in and who's out. Who's on the outside. Judgment. We're, we've been very good at that. And this is precisely why our current Pope is giving us this year to reflect on that. Does he exclude? Is he exclude? No. Does God exclude? That's a better question for us. But of course the Pope is the Vicar of Christ, as Christ's representative on earth. He speaks in a loud voice for... God and we look to him for a great example and today more than ever our world is in need we are so divided you know not just in our country but all over and what is it that is dividing the world more than anything religion think of all the great pain and harm and suffering that is inflicted all over the world on people and in massive numbers over religion. Muslim countries being torn apart within themselves, like Iraq. Over what? They hate each other because of what? Because of religion. Because one has this version of Islam and another has this version of Islam. And they can't stand each other. Because they want one to be like the other. You get it? I want you to be Shia because I'm Shia. I'm not going to respect you because you're a Kurd. And we've done that so many times. Look at Northern Ireland. Protestants and Catholics killing each other. Still. It's absolutely horrible. And look in our, in our own country today. You know, how many of us, you know, we can't even talk about it because it brings so much anger out in people. But we can't stand one another because one person is a Democrat and another is a Republican. It's absolutely unbelievable. You know, and so there, there is great fervor within us that is misdirected. Misdirected fervor. 
Religion is about tolerance. Love. The Bible makes it very clear. God is love. God is not exclusion. And so, many times we think we are teaching people a lesson, but our harsh, self-righteous treatment demoralizes rather than encourages. As shares in the universal priesthood of believers, we should minister God to one another. Now, this is something you may not be aware of, but when you are baptized, all of us are baptized into the priesthood of Jesus Christ, the universal priesthood of believers. So in baptism, we are all priests, prophets, and kings. And if you go to any baptism rite of children or the, we, we will be having the beautiful Easter vigil coming up and you go through it, you will see there this wonderful, wonderful belief that we are all priests. I am an ordained priest into the ministerial priesthood of Jesus Christ, but all of us are priests through our baptism. And that means we are appointed and charged to be ministers of God, ministers of mercy. And the one mark of a good priest, one mark of a good priest, is gentleness. You have to be gentle. Absolutely gentle. You have no idea how many people are turned away from the church by a priest, in this case a priest, a ministerial priest, uh, an ordained priest, treating them abruptly, saying something unkind. How many people are turned away? We have to be treating people with the utmost gentleness and understanding. And that's not just for priests who are ordained, but it's for all of us. We all have to treat the people in our lives with the utmost gentleness. You know, if, in other words, the Bible says, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. You, th you thought that this was, you know, just somebody just came up with that? No, it's in the Bible, because the Bible says what? The Bible says, say only the good things men need to hear. Only the good things. So, if, in other words, think before you say something. People's lives are already burdened as it is. The people in your lives, your, your family members, your friends, their lives are hard as it is. Don't add to it. Don't add to it. Gentleness. While all of us share in the common priesthood of all the baptized, some faithful are chosen to be priests and ministers of God's mercy in a very special way. But how do believers in general fulfill their roles as sharers in the common priesthood of all the faithful? What is the job of a priest? The job of a priest is to be the in-between, the go-between, between God and people. So the priest brings prayers on behalf of the people to God. That's why at Mass, I stand in the person of Jesus Christ and the prayers are all directed to God, our Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ. So I take your prayers. That's why you're bringing up the gifts at Mass. You bring the gifts and you give them to me and I offer them to God, our Father, for our sins, all our prayers, everything. And so uh, the one way we are all called to be priests, sharing in the common priesthood of Jesus Christ, is to intercede for people before God's throne of mercy. So what does that mean? Well, how much time do you spend criticizing the people in your life? And how much time do you spend praying for them? In other words, so many people say, you know, they, they come to me and they say, Father, what do I tell my son who doesn't go to church? What do I tell him? He doesn't go to church. What, 
get, tell me, what do I tell him? And I said, you know what I say? Shut up! <laughs> say nothing! <clears throat> All that effort that you're spending in talking to him about God, put that effort into talking to God about him. <laughs> Spend less time talking to him about God and more time talking to God about him. Do you think you have more power than God? No. You think you have any power to convert anyone? It's God who converts. It's God who converts. You look at the Bible everywhere. All over the Bible, we have these great personalities in the Bible. The very first one we meet is, of course, our father in faith, Abraham. Did Abraham go after God? No. Abraham did not pursue God. God pursued Abraham. Then the prophets, all the prophets. Moses, everyone. It's God who went after them and who chose them. What about Mary? Mary was 12 or 13 years old when she was pursued by God to become the mother of God's son. And Joseph and Paul and the apostles, they were minding their own business. They were fishermen and God chose them. As God chose you, you are not here because of anything you have done. You, you are here because of God's love. And God's grace. You know, we talk about grace all the time. Grace is God's free gift to us. It's freely given. God gives it to us. All of us. All people. And so, God's grace is so abundant, so full. So, if God was after Abraham, was after Moses, was after the prophets, was after Mary, was after the apostles, was after Joseph, was after all of the saints, was after Paul, don't you think God is after your family members and friends? Don't you think God is after your children who may have gone astray and may not be in the practice of the faith? They may not go to church. They may even say they're atheists. Uh, don't you think God is after them? He is. God is after them. And God will find them in God's time, not your time. What your job is, is to intercede for them in your common priesthood that you share in. That's why we are priests, all of us, in the common priesthood of all the baptized. We intercede for one another. So what do we do? We pray. One simple thing that you may not even be aware of. Whenever you go to church and you receive Holy Communion, you can offer that communion for the conversion of somebody in your life who may need it. That's why the church today says it's okay for us to receive in one day. If you attend Mass, the whole Mass, you can receive communion twice. Once you could go and receive for yourself. And another time you could receive for someone else in your life. Have you ever thought of that? That'd be, you'd be better served in doing that than yapping away at the people in your life. And thinking, and thinking, you know, what is it that, what is it that I can do? And what is it that I can do? So, save your questions for the end, okay? Write them down and save your questions okay. till the end. Okay, because you're, you're, you, you get me off track and then I won't... Okay. So, save your questions to the end. Write them down and we will have questions at the end. So, you offer communion for someone else in your life. Stations of the Cross during, during Lent. On Good Friday, we have Stations of the Cross. You can offer those for someone else in your life. Having a Mass said for someone in your life. It doesn't have to be. Masses are not just said for dead people in our life. And so many, if you, look at, if you look at the bulletin, most of the Masses that we say are for people who have already passed. And that's great. We do pray for those who have passed away. But what about those who are alive? In other words, we bring intercessory prayers. We pray for all of those. That's, 
a great act of mercy. If you look at Pope Francis, what is the one phrase he always, whenever, he's, whenever he finishes Mass, whenever he meets with anyone, what is, at, at the end of any meeting, at the end of any Mass, at the end of anything, he always says, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. See, we have, we have gotten away from this notion that prayer works. You know, we, 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 we like to rely on our own abilities. What can I do? What can I do? What can I do to help? God is all-powerful. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God is all-powerful? Ask yourself. These are rhetorical questions for yourself to ask you. Do I believe that God is all-powerful? If God is all-powerful, and if God, the Bible says, can move mountains, don't you think God can move the little heart of your husband, or your son, or your daughter, or your granddaughter, or your grand grandson, or your brother or your sister, don't you think God can move their little heart? If God can move mountains? Of course. The only problem for us is that we measure everything based on time. We, we live in what we call chronos time. So, you know, we, that's why we have calendars. That's where we get chronological from. Uh, the word chronos is a Greek word. It's a term that describes how we live our life. We have days, we have calendars, we have watches, we have hours, we have everything. God does, no. The Bible says, for God, a thousand years are like one day come and gone. And for God, one day is like a thousand years. In other words, God lives in what we call, in theological terms, in Kairos time. K-A-I-R-O-S. Kairos time. For God, there are no days. There are no minutes. There are no calendars. That's all us. We live like that. God doesn't live that way. That's why, you know, uh, a couple weeks ago, on a Sunday, I had the immense privilege and opportunity to baptize a two-day-old baby who passed away. Two days old. And the baby passed away right after I baptized the baby. And you think to yourself, how? And, and yet, I also anointed a 104-year-old who died. So how is it that somebody that's two days old and then somebody else is 104 years old. Because God's ways are not our ways. The ways of God are not the ways of men. God's ways are not our ways. God is different. And you know, talk about prayer. I'm going to share this with all of you because, uh, you know, we, we, we have gotten away from the idea that prayer works. And if there's anything that I believe in that I have experienced as a priest in these six years of being a priest, almost six years, is seeing the fruit of prayer. Not the fruit of words, not the fruit of people yapping, but the fruit of prayer. I got a call on that Sunday morning to go and baptize the baby, the two-day-old baby that was born. And I'm already in the car going to Summerlin's ha uh, prenatal, um, the neonatal unit, neonatal ICU, and I'm on my way there. And the secretary, Lagaya, calls me back on Sunday morning, she was the receptionist, and she calls and she says, Father, don't go, because the baby has already died. Mm. Don't go. They just called for you not to go, because the baby has already died. And I hung up the phone with her, and my car phone, and there was something in me that said, no. And I called her right back, and I said, call them back and tell them I'm going anyway. And I began to pray, and I said, Lord, you can do everything. You can do all things. 
do not allow this baby to die without me being able to baptize the baby first. Don't allow the baby to die. And I began to pray and pray. And I got there to that I, uh, neonatal ICU unit. And the mother is holding the baby. And the nurse said, he has a heartbeat. He, he has a heartbeat. He hasn't passed yet. He has a heartbeat. We couldn't hear it before, but now he does. And the doctor came in and listened and he said, yes, he still has a heartbeat. He had already been disconnected. He has a heartbeat. And I said, so I said to the parents, you want your baby to be baptized? Oh, yes. Yes, Father. And I baptized him in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And literally, I was watching the clock, three minutes passed and he died oh. baptized and went right to heaven and you know people were saying oh they have an angel in heaven no right. not an angel they don't have an angel in heaven we don't believe in that no. we believe in saints we are catholics mm -hmm. the definition of a saint is anybody who is in heaven that's the definition of a saint. That family has their own personal saint now in heaven. What a gift. Because, and what do the saints do? They pray for us. The saints pray for us. And so I told them, I said, you don't have an angel in heaven, you have a saint. Right there. This is your own personal saint that you have in heaven that's going to be praying with for you, accompanying you, walking with you throughout your life. What a gift. That's, the, that's what the saints do for us. Whenever, you know, somebody who's not Catholic, they say to me, Father, what's all this stuff about all of you and, uh, uh, and the saints? Why do you have to pray to saints? Well, first of all, we don't pray to saints. You know that. We don't pray to saints. We ask the saints to pray for us. We don't say, Holy Mary, Mother of God, hear my prayer. Do we say that? No. We say, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray, pray for us. Because the saints pray for us. The only one who hears our prayers is God. God is the only one who hears our prayers. That's why we say, Holy, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us. We ask the saints, or Mary, in this case Mary is the most powerful because she is the Mother of God, Okay, we ask them to pray for us, and that's what they do. They intercede for us. They bring our prayers to God, and we know that from the Bible. Look at the wedding feast at Cana. Did Jesus want to turn the water into wine? No, but it's because Mary said so, and Mary says, do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you, because she knew that what she was going to ask him, because she's his mother, and you don't refuse your mother, okay? You don't refuse your mama, okay? You don't refuse your mother. And so, that's what we do. So, I always say to people who are not Catholic, I say, well, can I ask you to pray for me? Oh, yes. Of course. Well, what's the difference? Why can't I ask somebody who's already in heaven? Oh, but the Bible in such and such a section says that the dead do not hear. Okay? Well, the Bible says a lot of things. The Bible says you can have slaves. We are in the 21st century. How many of us would agree with slavery today? Nobody. Right? That's why we have the church to interpret the Bible for us. And we have tradition in the church to, to feed us into... Open up the scriptures for us. This is why we have Pope Francis. Because this was written some 2,000 years ago. We are in the 21st century, not in the 1st century. It's so different for us today. And so, this is also should be some comfort for all of you. All of you have lost family members and friends. Have you not? All of us have. We have all lost family members and friends. They are not dead. They are alive, and if you believe that they are in heaven, then you have your own personal saint in heaven. And so, stop, you know, going all, always and only to the canonized saints. You know, the ones like St. Joseph or St. Uh, Polycarp 
or St. Chrysogonus or St. Symphorosa or St. Dymphna. I'm giving you here, uh, I know uh, we have, what is your name again? Alana. Alana, Alana, she's pregnant. I'm giving you name ideas for your baby here. <laughs> And those are canonized saints. Those are canonized saints. But those from our families who have passed away that we believe are in heaven, they are our own personal saints. And they know you more intimately than St. Dymphna. I guarantee you that. They know you more intimately than St. Symphorosa and her seven sons. Okay? They know you more intimately than St. Stanislaus does. Right? And so, do not... Be afraid of that. We are all connected. In the Catholic Church, we believe in something called the communion of saints. Those who are in heaven, those who are in purgatory, meaning they are awaiting their entrance into heaven, and those who are of us who are here on earth, we are all connected. And that's why, for me, this is so special. That's why I'm telling you, it's absolutely fabulous to be Catholic. It's just, we don't know what we have. That's our problem. This is somebody, some, whenever somebody tells me, I used to be Catholic, you know. Well, you don't know what you had. You don't know what you had, because if you knew what you had, you would have never left. You would have never left. And so, this is a challenge for all of us to continually rediscover what we have. The richness of what we have in the church. Because if we truly... No, what we have, our lives are made so much better. Let me tell you, my grandfather, I told you that I, I'm from Poland and uh, my grandfather was a member of the Communist Party. And he was a staunch communist. You know, he never went to church. Never went to church because you couldn't. Because if you did, you would have, you know, you would have been thrown out, or you would not get the perks that people got who, who, uh, who did not go to church because communism is officially atheist. There is no God, and so on Sunday morning when we would be getting ready to go to church because uh, I was with my grandmother uh, and my um, and my grandfather in Poland. We all lived in the same place and on Sunday mornings when me and my brother and my grandma would be getting ready to go to church my grandfather would always say what are you all doing you're wasting your time work is my God work is my God you're wasting your time and you know what my grandmother did throughout all of those years that she was married to my grandfather more than 40 years. Do you know what she did throughout all that time? She prayed for him. There was never arguments about religion. She would get up and go to church and he would ridicule and say, make sure you pray for me. You know, uh, she would never, she would never ever, she would never say anything. She would never say anything. And Everything changed in his life. In one week. On a Tuesday, he was diagnosed with colon cancer. Mm -hmm. On a Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And the following Sunday, I entered the kitchen and we had a stove in the kitchen. We didn't have running water. We just had a stove. You had to go to the well and bring the water to the house. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we had a big stove. And there by the stove, my grandfather is sitting all dressed up. And this is Sunday morning. And I said, why are you all dressed up? And he says, I'm going to church with you today. And, I, and at that, my grandmother entered the kitchen, pulled me out of the kitchen, okay, <laughs> and said, shh, let's just go along with it. Let's just go along with it. And you know why he was dressed up? Because we used to dress up. And it was a chore. Remember, we had no running water. That means you had to heat the water. We took our weekly bath, okay? 
to go to church, our weekly bath, whether we needed it or not, we took our <laughs> weekly bath, okay? And you had to heat the water, bring it into the house, heat it. And especially during winter, you could get sick very easily. So you, we only had two rooms, just the one room and then the kitchen, the one room where we slept, and then the, we also slept in the kitchen as well. And so it was a great chore, but you would not go to church without wearing your Sunday clothes and without being bathed. Mm -hmm. And that's a think of th that's something today. You know, I mean, you look at people coming to church and they they go to the movie theater better dressed. Oh yeah, go to the movie theater better dressed. You know. I mean, it's, it's good. At least people are coming. That's a good thing, you know. And that's why, you know, I, I never say anything, okay. Again, part of mercy. No, I'm just making a general comment, okay. Because I, some of you are shaking your head, but some of you are guilty of that as well, you know. <laughs> I mean, because we, we, many times we just think it's no big deal. And so my grandfather went to church with us that day. And he eventually went to confession because he was, he was born before the war, before World War II, and so his, his parents had him baptized he, uh, before communism hit right after uh, World War II. He, so he had the seed. That's something for all of you who you have had your children baptized and maybe they have stopped going to church or your family members. The seed is there. The hope is there. As my great-grandparents, they, they gave the seed. So my grandfather had the seed, and the seed was reawakened by this horrible experience of being diagnosed with stage 4 colon cancer and being given a death sentence. You know? And he went to church with us. He went to confession. Well, eventually he died eight months later after that. He died of colon cancer. Oh. And now I believe that my grandfather is my own personal saint in heaven. Mm -hmm. Hello. Now I believe that my own, I have my own personal saint in heaven. And let me tell you, there, my, my grandfather was fascinated by coins in his life. He was always fascinated by coins. He loved coins. And one coin that he really liked was the penny. Here are two pennies. Okay, so he was fascinated by pennies. And let me tell you, there's not a day that goes by that I do not find a penny somewhere. Today, I've already found two. Mm -hmm. Now, for, for you or for some of you here, you probably are going to be saying, well, that's just a coincidence. There's pennies everywhere. Well, maybe for you that's coincidence. But for me, this is my faith that is telling me that my grandfather is okay. That he's in heaven. That he's a saint. That he's reaping his rewards in heaven. That he's in the loving arms of God and that He's watching over me, that He's with me, that He's proud of me, that He prays for me. That's faith for all of us. And you know, we're getting to something here that is very poignant because religious people sometimes have a hard time accepting the God that we are speaking about here. And it's the God of mercy. Because religious people can look at my grandfather and say, you've got to be kidding me. He spent his whole life battling God, battling the church, being a member of the Communist Party, ridiculing faith, and then at the end, at the end of his life, he can just have a free pass? And like that? And you, you're telling me that he, he got to go to heaven? <sighs> yes. 
That's hard for us to internalize, but that's the God we believe in. And you know why we have a hard time with that? Because we're not like that. Because we are not like that. We do not forgive and forget. Most of us, we, we, we forgive with our lips. We say, I, I forgive you, but, but. <laughs> You know? And God is calling us to forgive from the heart. And if you forgive from the heart, you forgive moving on. I, I like to use the story of uh, Clara Barton. You know, Clara Barton was the founder of the uh, American, not the American Red Cross, but the International Red Cross. And Clara Barton was a fantastic woman, a holy woman, a saint. She founded the International Red Cross. And she experienced in her life something that was absolutely tragic and that is absolutely tragic that I have seen destroy families, break up relationships, destroy lives. And that is that her husband cheated on her. That's a, it's unbelievable pain for people to have their spouse cheat on them. Maybe you've experienced that in your life. You know, it's an unbelievable pain. One of, one, of the, uh, one of the things is I always make it a point when I meet with couples to say to them, you know, uh, when you're marrying someone, you don't marry them conditionally. When you're marrying somebody, you don't say, I'm going to marry you, but if you do so and so, it's over. So you can't marry somebody and say, I'm going to be married to them, but if you cheat on me, it's over. No. You don't do that. You marry without conditions, through thick or thin. And that is a very hard concept for people. That's why so many marriages today are not valid, because people marry conditionally. They marry thinking, well, if they do such, if they do such and such a thing, it's over. You don't marry anybody like that. You marry people with no conditions. If your husband cheats on you, you work through it. That you can't marry somebody and say, I'm going to be married to you, but if you cheat on me, it's going to be over. And this one time I was saying this to, the, to this couple, and I said to, uh, I said to her, do you accept this? Because I said to him, I said, you know, you accept this, right? I said, if, if she cheats on you, you're going to work through it. Right? And he said, oh yes. And then I looked at her and I said to her, I said, you know, if he cheats on you, you're still going to take him back and all that. And she says, no, we're not going to be married. And I said, why? And she says, because I'll kill him. <laughs> <laughs> I'll kill him. But Clara Barton had, the, had this thing happen to her. Her husband cheated on her. And you know who he cheated on her with? With her best, best friend. friend. That's in her, in her autobiography. It, with her best friend, her bestie. They were like this tight, okay? With her best friend. Her husband cheated on her. And, you know, people, people are people, so... After a while, Clara Barton is seen uh, having, resuming her friendship with this best friend. As if nothing, they continuing to talk, hang out together, go to dinner together, as if nothing. And all the people in the neighborhood, you know how people are. Clara, how could you do this? Don't you remember what she did to you? Don't you remember that she cheated on she cheated on you? She cheated too, not just the husband, right? Because they had a relationship as well. Did, did she she betrayed you in such a way? Don't you remember what she did? She slept with your husband. Don't you remember? And Clara looked at the people and said, "You know, I don't remember what she did to me, but I remember the moment in which I forgave her.
I remember the moment in which I forgave her. I don't remember what she did to me, but I remember the moment I forgave her. That's what God did to my grandfather. He didn't remember all the past, what my grandfather had done, said, nothing. That's what happens when we go to God sincere and repentant. God wipes out everything. That's why confession is so beautiful, so wonderful. You go, you confess your sins, and you're, it's all wiped away. Your soul becomes as white as this paper. Again, just as when you are baptized. That's what happens in confession. Does God remember what you have done? No! So, why do you dwell on the things that people have done to you? I, I forgive, but I don't want anything to do with her. I don't want anything to do with him. Father, I forgive my ex-husband, but let me tell you this, who he is, and then they give some pronoun, you know, adjectives and things, you know, that I can't. <laughs> Father, I forgive my ex-husband, but let me tell you what he did to me. Have you really forgiven your ex-husband? I mean, come on. If you had forgiven, there wouldn't be a list. You wouldn't be dwelling so much. That's the forgiveness God is calling us to in our life. A forgiveness that doesn't dwell on what happened, that doesn't remember what happened, but that remembers and dwells on the moment you decided to move on. To move on. And you say, well, you know, but what if the person hurts me again? That's life. People hurt us over and over again. And what are we going to do? Throw them away? Do you love conditionally? Or do you love unconditionally? Especially when you're getting married, I always say, do you love conditionally? Because if you have any conditions, it's not a real marriage. It's not a real marriage. If you come into a marriage relationship, if you come into a marriage relationship with any conditions, you do not have a valid marriage in the eye. That's the teaching of the Catholic Church. There's no conditions. Now, we are married to Christ because we are the body of Christ, we are told. We are the, we are the body of Christ, the church. The church is the body of Christ. We are, the, we are called, we're, we're told we are the bride of Christ, the church. And the church is not uh, me or the bishop or the Pope. The church is all of us. We are all the body of Christ, each one of us. That's why we're all so different. So, Jesus is married to us, and He loves us unconditionally. 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 Now, He's calling us to do the same with one another, to love those around us unconditionally. Yes, you've been hurt in the past. So has everybody. So was Jesus. Was he not? Who hurt him the most in his life? It was the people closest to him that hurt him. The two closest to him, Peter, whom he chose to be the first pope, the leader, and Judas Iscariot. And we call, we call Judas Iscariot the betrayer of Jesus. But really, Peter is also the great betrayer of Jesus as well. How many times did Peter betray Jesus? Three times. Three times. Peter betrayed Jesus three times. And people only focus on the fact that Judas, but Judas betrayed Jesus how many times? Peter betrayed him three times. But here's the difference. Why did... What's, well, what's the difference between the two? Let's just ask that. What's the difference between Judas and Peter? Is it that one loved Jesus and the other didn't? No. Both loved Jesus. Both were in love with Jesus. 
That's why both of them cried. Peter, after the cock crowed three times, he goes and he weeps, the Bible says. What does the Bible say about Judas Iscariot after he betrays Jesus? He also weeps. He doesn't just cry. He weeps. He's heartbroken because he has betrayed the Lord, the one he loved. But the difference between the two is that Peter, even though he betrayed him three times, picked himself up and believed in the mercy of God. Judas Iscariot did not pick himself up because he did not believe that he was forgivable. He didn't believe in the forgiveness of God, in the mercy of God. That's why he went and he hung himself. He took his own life. He gave up, in other words. He gave up. You and I are called to have the faith of Peter. That's why it's on Peter's faith that the church is built. Jesus says to Peter, you are the rock, and on this rock I will build my church. It's on, we are the church of Peter because we are to be the church of mercy always focusing on the mercy of God. That no matter what I have done in my past, I am to pick myself up. And if I am truly repentant, if I truly re repent of my sins, then God forgives me. That's why on Ash Wednesday, when you are marked with the ashes, we say, repent and believe in the gospel. The repenting is one thing. To be sorry is one thing. Judas was sorry for what he did, but he didn't have the second part. He didn't believe in the gospel, the good news. He didn't believe that he could be forgiven. You and I are called not just to repent. In other words, to be sorry for what we have done. It's like the women who have abortions. They feel absolutely sorry for what they have done. But many of them come and they confess it over and over and over and over again. And that's why one of the greatest ministries of the church is for our post-abortion ministries. Rachel's Vineyard is one of them. To minister to women who have had abortions. I'm just giving you one example here of somebody that has people in our midst who have a hard time believing in the gospel. And on some level, we all are like that with things that we have done. We repent, but we have a hard time believing. That's why you, you keep dwelling on things, and people bring things up over and over again in the confessional. You know, I just want to tell you, but you've already been to confession 20 years ago for this. Oh, but it's still bothering me. It's still eating away at me. That has nothing to do with repentance. It has everything to do with belief. You haven't believed. You don't have that. You have to come to that. And that is only the fruit of prayer. Lord, help my unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. And this is why we are in the year of mercy. The Pope looked at the church and he saw this deficiency of mercy. Deficiency of our focus on mercy. We've been so focused so much on sin, sin, and sin. What's wrong and what's right. On rules and regulations. But not focused on mercy. It's like, you know, uh, people, the religious people, and sometimes the religious people can be some of the worst people, you know, because of our fervor you know, inside of us. Uh, that, you know, we're so excited about what we have and what we believe and that we can then in, in that become very judgmental, look down on others because we want them to have what I have. And in, in turn, that rubs people the wrong way. And we can, instead of bringing people in, we can turn them away. And so uh, today, you know, there is that in the church, there, there is this, the, we have this problem of people who would look at someone like my grandfather and would say, what's he doing here? What's he doing here? He needs to do so and so and so and so. 
And God doesn't work that way. It's this whole idea of, you know, if, for example, those of you who have children, think of this. If your child, uh, who is 18, goes away to college, they go away to college, and they've been in college, and they haven't been in contact with you because they are rebellious, and teenagers get that way, you know. They say, once I'm 18, I'm out, you know. And they go to college, and, they, they've been, and so they're, they're, they're away for four years, and they've been away, and they've led a life, a loose life in college, done all sorts of things, the imaginable, gotten into all sorts of trouble, gotten spiked up hair, <laughs> tattoos all over, all sorts of things. And then after four years of you not having contact with your, with your child, let's say it's your son, you haven't had contact with him for four years, okay? You're heartbroken because you haven't had contact with him for four years. And he went away to college and led this loose life, got all tattooed and, all sort and got spiked hair. And after four years, he decides to come home and he walks through the door. What is your reaction going to be? What have you done? You're tattooed all over. Look at your hair. Is that what your reaction would be? And some of you, that might be your reaction. Because that's, that's how we treat a lot of people who come back to church. And that's how we treat a lot of people who walk through our doors. That's how we treat a lot of people who come back into our lives who have been away. And is that what your reaction would be? What have you done? Or is your first reaction going to be, I'm so happy to see you. I've missed you. Come. Rejoice. For you have come. That's how God treats each and every one of us. That child that is away for four years, when that child comes back, whatever child it is, you know, and, and all of us are children of God, when we are away from the love of God, and from God's arms. When we come back, that's how God embraces us. Come! I'm so happy you're here. <coughs> I rejoice. You are here with me. And that's how we are to be with one another because that's how God treats us. With embrace, with kindness and compassion. See, you don't know why the people in your life are the way they are. You really don't know. You think you know, but you really don't. Are you inside of their head? You know, we think we know, but we don't know. People go through so much. As a priest, I have the immense privilege, and I look at it as a great privilege. Whenever anybody comes and, you know, they bear their soul out to me, and they tell me, you have, you, you'd be shocked. Some of the people who you look at and say, oh, they have everything together. You don't know what's going on in people's lives. People's lives are so full of suffering and pain and anguish. People have very hard lives. Don't add to it. Don't add to it. You don't want God to reject you, and God doesn't reject you, and God doesn't call you to reject anybody in your life. And so, one person who lived the common priesthood that we all share very well. In fact, uh, he refused to be ordained a priest, like me. He refused ordination. Saint Francis of Assisi. Have you heard of him? Oh, yeah. Saint Fran do you know that he wasn't a priest? He was just a deacon. He, was, he said, I do not want to be ordained a priest. He didn't feel worthy. Nobody's worthy, of course. But he didn't want it. But he lived the common priesthood of believers so well. And he said this very powerful, powerful phrase that I think needs to be embedded in the hearts of all of us. And that is, preach the gospel at all times. Only when necessary, use words. In other words, our lives have to be testimony to the gospel, to the good news. Our lives have to testify. The way we treat other people. 
Why is it that, you know, and I told you that people, uh, there's a lot of religious people today, um, conservative people, whatever you want to call, uh, people who are uh, very right wing or whatever you want to call in the church. I'm not, I'm not speaking here politically, okay? Not, I'm speaking here in the church, who are very, very much on the right of things. Uh, they don't like Pope Francis. They don't like him. They, and, and it's shocking because, you know, I, I, and I loved Pope Benedict too, and I loved, you know, my countrymen, uh, St. John Paul II. I mean, you know, we have had wonderful popes, but Pope Francis is God's gift to the church at this time. Either you believe that the Holy Spirit is running the church, or you don't. You know, people say, well, and they say, well, he's not really the true Pope. Benedict is the Pope, you know, because he's still alive. There was a, there was a conspiracy that took place, and, you know. Uh, so, either, and, and, it's, and it's even in our parish, there is this group that's passing out some pamphlets and things. I'm, I'm being very serious right now. I know some of you are, yes, and they're, they're promoting this, and they're saying, you know, the, this Pope is not the real Pope. And either you believe that the Holy Spirit is running the church, or you don't. And Jesus said, Lo, this is our, his last words, Lo, I am with you always, until the end of the age. So, until, and, and Jesus said, not, not even the gates of the netherworld, not even the gates of hell have the power to destroy the church. Nothing. God is with us. The Holy Spirit is running the church, and Pope Francis is a great gift for the church at this time. But we have a hard time accepting that, and there's people who have a hard time accepting this because they, they, they don't like the message. And if you don't like the message, you attack the messenger. You know, I always like to say, uh, if, if the Holy Spirit was not running the Catholic Church, then the church would have been gone a long time ago. If you think the church has problems today, look at the history. There was a time when we had three popes in the church. The great, the great Western schism, great suffering, lots, I mean, and the church has survived because it's the Holy Spirit that's running the church. You remember Napoleon? Napoleon uh, Bonaparte, who was this uh, he was conquering all of Europe. And he was a very powerful man. And he was conquering all of Europe. And everybody was afraid of Napoleon. Everybody was afraid of him. And he got to Rome. And everybody was so scared because, he got to, because Napoleon was going to come and destroy the church. Everybody was scared. And all the bishops were so scared, including the Pope at the time. There's this, uh, the Pope at the time, Pope Pius VII, he went to the, uh, to the coronation of Napoleon, because they were all scared of him. And when he got to the coronation, he was going to put the crown on Napoleon, and Napoleon took the crown and put it on himself, because nobody was more powerful than Napoleon, he said. And so, great disrespect to the Pope at the time. But anyway, everybody was scared. That's why the Pope went. And, uh, everybody was scared when Napoleon came into Rome, except this one old cardinal, very old. And he was sitting in the corner, and he's laughing and giggling. And Napoleon looks at him and says, why are you laughing? Don't you know I have the power to destroy the church? I'm Napoleon Bonaparte. Don't you know I have the power to destroy the church? And the cardinal is laughing and looks at him and says, Listen, what makes you think you can destroy the church? We have been trying to do it for 1,700 years. <laughs> <laughs> Think about that. Mm. Awesome. Think about that. The Pope we have today is a great gift to the church and he's teaching us so much. And he took the name of Francis. 
Francis of Assisi and the great theme of Francis. Francis of Assisi encountered the church in great turmoil and disarray. And God, he heard the voice of God. Jesus spoke to Francis and told him, Rebuild my church. Not the physical structure, but rebuild my church spiritually. And isn't this what this Pope is trying to do? That's why the world is drawn to him. People who are atheists, people who are unbelievers, people are drawn to him because they see in him a messenger of mercy. A messenger of mercy. That is saying God is mercy and God is calling you to be merciful. That's how our world will change if we learn to show mercy to each other. So the prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light, and where there is sadness, joy, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. So, we should make that prayer each of our prayers internalize that prayer so how do we go about living out this priestly lifestyle in in our lives being great intercessors in other words for one another for our for those in our lives how do we go about doing that well the bible tells us that one essential disposition is gentleness a priest is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is subject to weakness since he himself is subject to weakness now this is not speaking about only ministerial priests it's speaking about all of us in other words what is this saying here why should you put up with the people around you? Because they put up with you. <laughs> you are not the last Coca-Cola in the desert. <laughs> mm. You know what our problem sometimes is? Is what uh, my grandma used to say, you know, that we smell ourselves too much. Mm -hmm. You smell in yourself too much, she used to say. <laughs> You know, yeah. You smell in yourself too much. You think too much of yourself. In other words, we have to pray for humility. What is the one mark of Pope Francis today? Everybody talks about that, how humble he is. He carries his own bag. You know, he, he rides in a simple car. Not only that, after he was elected Pope, he went to the, because they, the, all the cardinals were staying in, in a hotel, it's called the Casa Santa Marta in, in Rome, and he went to the reception desk to pay his own bill. And he rode with the other cardinals on the bus. He doesn't live in a palace. He lives in a simple two-bedroom hotel room. He cooks for himself. He yeah. does everything. That is the great example of humility. But it is the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, who the Bible in Philippians, that's the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians, not like in one church when people were reading, you know, they read a letter from the, a reading from the letter of Paul to the Philippians, and they read, a reading from the letter of Paul to the Filipinos. <laughs> <laughs> It's not to the Filipinos, it's to the Philippians. And the letter to the Philippians tells us about Jesus and the way he was. That Jesus, even though he was God, did not deem his equality with God something to be grasped. But rather, Jesus emptied himself. Emptied himself. Taking on human form. Becoming like us. 
and he became a slave for us, the letter to the Philippians tells us. Slave, in other words, servant. Servant. You know, at the Last Supper, let me tell you something, because this, is, this, this could revolutionize you know, your understanding of the Last Supper. When we gather for the Last Supper, that's the Mass, right? We call it the Holy Eucharist. The word Eucharist means Thanksgiving. Uh, when we gather there, we call to mind the one memory that Jesus took bread, pronounced the consecration, the blessing over the bread, and what did he say? Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. Then he took the cup, pronounce the blessing over the cup, take this, all of you, and drink from it. Right? This is the chalice of my blood, which will be shed for you. Do this in memory of me, he said at the end. Do this in memory of me, which is why we do that. Because Jesus said, do it. That's why we have Holy Mass and the Eucharist, because that's what Jesus commanded us. He said, do this. But something else happened. What else happened at the Last Supper? Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. Jesus washed their feet. Now Philippians tells us that Jesus became what? A slave for us. Now at the Last Supper, Jesus washes the feet of those he loved. Now, during Jesus' time, let me explain something to you. People wore sandals. <laughs> and it was dry outside. It was a des it's a desert. This is the Holy Land. It's a desert. And when people would be walking outside, they, their feet would be open. They would be wearing sandals. And the sand would get in between their toes. Have you been to the beach? What happens when the sand gets in your toes? It's very uncomfortable, isn't it? That's why they have those little showers to get your feet off before you go to your hotel room, okay? Why, that's why, why, because it's very uncomfortable, isn't it? Well, it was the same thing during Jesus' day. And so, it was the job of slaves. People had slaves during those times. So the Bible talks about that. Okay? They had slaves. And it was the job of a slave when anybody entered the home to get down on their knees and wash the feet of whoever came in to make them comfortable. And so Jesus becomes a slave for his followers. And he gets down on his knees and he washes their feet. And that's why Peter protested and said, you won't do that for me. Because you're my master. You're my master. In other words, master means you're my teacher. You're my rabbi. You're my Lord. You're my everything. And you're going to become a slave and wash my feet? And what does Jesus say? Unless I do that for, for, for you, you are not worthy of me. And then Peter says, well, wash everything, okay? But Jesus pronounces something very important that we have forgotten. We have forgotten this because it's very convenient for us to forget. We have forgotten it. Jesus says, if I, your Lord and Master, get down on my knees and wash your feet, you are to do likewise for each other. You are to do likewise for each other. In other words, that's do this in memory of me. There are two memories at Mass that we call to mind, but we have forgotten the other one. Why? Because it's convenient. It's easy to go and recognize, you know, Jesus and say, Oh, Jesus is there in the, in the Eucharist. How wonderful. But it's hard to recognize Jesus in the people around me. And remember at Mass, Jesus is not just present in the bread and the wine. Jesus is present in the assembly gathered there. Jesus is present in the Word of God. That's why at church we have a light there by the Bible as well. And in the tabernacle we have another light. 
They're different presences of Jesus, but they are the presence of Jesus. We gathered here. Jesus is present here in our midst. That's why he says, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in their midst. Jesus is here. But we conveniently forget what he taught us to wash each other's feet. Unless you wash each other's feet, he said to Peter. Unless I wash your feet, you're not worthy of me. And that is a call. That is a call to servitude. If Jesus became a servant for us, he calls us to do likewise for one another. And that's what we call to mind every time we gather for Mass. The call to service. How do we go about doing that? Well, first of all, the first part of getting better. If, you, if you're an alcoholic, or if you're a drug addict, or if you're a gambler, if you have a problem with gambling, if you have any, or if you have a eating disorder or eating problem, or you overeat, if you have any type of problems that require you to get better, any type of addictions, and you enter a 12-step program, what is the first part, the first step of any 12-step program? Admitting that you need to change. That's the first part. That's what we have to do. Admitting that we have to change. In other words, we have to say to the Lord, I have strayed and I need to become better. In other words, I am a sinner. I have sinned. It's like, you know, whenever I tell people, you need to go to confession. Everybody, we all need to. We all need to change. All of us. And then inevitably somebody comes and says, Father, but I don't have any sins. You know, I just can't think of anything. I, you know what I say? Well, let's just take that statue of Mary down and put you up there, okay? <laughs> if you don't have any sins. We all have things that we need to change in our life. All of us. And so that's the first part. To get better is to admit, I am not the best wife I can be. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I am not the best mother I can be. You can always do better. The minute you say, I'm a finished product, you know, the minute you say, oh, I just, you know, uh, I'm a great wife. You know, I have been just the best mother ever. Look at all the things I've done for my children. You know, the minute, the minute you have that attitude, that's the attitude of pride. That's pride there. That's the devil working on you. You have to have the attitude that I'm, I, I can be better. We can all be better. All of us. All of us can be better. And the second part of the first part of any 12-step program is that alone, I can't get better. Alone, I can't do it. I need the help of a higher power. And these are secular programs. These are secular programs that say you need the help of a higher power. You can't do it alone. And then they say, you know, whatever that higher power is for you. Well, for us, that higher power is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our higher power. He is our Lord and our Master who helps us. And He says, ask whatever you want in my name and I will give it to you. Do you know that God answers each and every prayer? God answers each prayer. All of your prayers are heard and answered, but not on your terms. Our problem is we want our prayers to be answered like this. We want everything to, you know... We want things to be on our terms, everything to be like this. God answers our prayers on His terms. And in God's time, not our time. What is it that you have to do? Persevere. 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 That, now that's hard to do. In other words, I have been praying for all these years. God doesn't hear me. Keep praying. 
Keep praying. God hears you. God not only hears you, God answers you. I have, I've, I've told you before, I have great examples of how God, I, I, if there's one thing that I know, and that is that there is a God, I'm so, and that God hears me, and God hears our prayers. I, I, I feel it. I just, uh, I can't describe it. You know, I was, I was 12 years old, and I was in, my, in, in our parish church in Chicago, and I, I didn't want to be a priest. I was involved in the, ch in the church, you know, nominally, going to religious education classes. Why was I going to the religious education classes? Well, because my aunt said that, you know, we have to, my father's sister, she said you have to go to religious education classes because what happened was my parents were going through a divorce and as they were going through a divorce, um, you, there's a lot of turmoil that happens in families. As a, those of you who've been touched by divorce, you know that very well. And there was a lot of turmoil in our, in our house. And so I was looking for solace. And the one place that I was looking for solace was McDonald's. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so sitting in McDonald's one day, these people from the Baptist church came upon me. Mm -hmm. And they invited me to their church. And not that I was interested in going to their church, but they told me, some, they told me something magical. They said, yes. we have pizza! Oh. I was sold! <laughs> I was sold! They had pizza! <laughs> and so I, was, I began to go to their church, because, especially because they had pizza. And anyway, they taught me a lot of things about the Bible. I, you know, I fell in love with with the Bible in many ways there. It was wonderful, but my aunt found out about it, that I was going there. <laughs> my parents couldn't, you know, they, they, they were indifferent, they had their own issues, you know. But my aunt found out about it and she said, over my dead body. <laughs> Our family has been Catholic for generations and you will change religions for pizza? <laughs> you all the pizza you want <laughs> and so she took me to our parish and she says you know you'll be going to these classes here in the parish and I was and there was a nun who took a liking at me she she was wonderful absolutely wonderful and I don't know if she's still alive I, I haven't been able to locate her to tell her but she said to me she says have you ever thought of being a priest and I said no no, I do no, you know, and I was protesting and she looked at me and she says, well, I think you will make a wonderful priest. And she says, and I will pray that God will give you the vocation to be a priest. And I kind of brushed it off. Well, here I am. Here I am. And I, I believe it's the fruit of her prayers. She says, I will offer my holy hour for you and your vocation. And here I am today, the fruit of prayer. The fruit of prayer, perseverance. And I don't, I, if you ask me, you know, people ask me, they say, well, how come you're a priest? What happened? I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. The only thing I can say is she prayed. She believed. She persevered. She prayed. I don't know. Why am I here in Las Vegas? I don't know. I really don't know. I, I, I don't know why I, I've been assigned to St. Joseph, husband of Mary. I don't know. The only thing I know is I love being here with all of you wonderful people. And especially if I as I look at all of you with your beautiful faces. But the fruit of prayer. And let me tell you, never give up. God hears each and every prayer that you have. Each prayer that you have. I want to conclude this part before we break for lunch because I know all of you are so hungry. I can just tell the hungry faces. <laughs> Don't faint. 
But I want to conclude by telling you that, as I told you, you know, part of that experience of moving here to the United States, uh, it, it's been wonderful. Um, but there's also, you know, when, whenever you have economic prosperity, whenever you have things that can supersede family, it can kind of blind you to that which is important. And that also happened in my family. Um, as I was telling you, my, my parents were going through a, a very terrible divorce, and they did. So it was an absolutely awful divorce um, with a court case and everything. And I, I, I went with my mother, my brother went with my father. It was an absolutely horrible time in my life. And as a result of that divorce, they began to show great animosity toward each other and great hate, I would say. They said, you know, we hate each other. I mean, I, I can't stand him and I can't stand her. And from the time they divorced and I went to live with my mother, I always prayed, always prayed. That was my one prayer all the time. You know, Lord, help my parents, help my family, you know, uh, help them to talk again. Uh, in other words, I, I need a miracle, God. <laughs> You know what that's like in your own life. Whatever it is that you're praying for in your own life. And everybody's got their own family and personal issues. Everybody's got their own set of miracles that they're looking for. Well, that was mine. That was what I was looking for in my life. And I was praying. Praying and praying. And there were times... I have to tell you, you know, I mean, we, I went to the seminary and during my seminary experience we had these great retreats. And there was one time I went to this one priest uh, who was giving us a retreat like I'm giving you this one here today. And I said to him, I said, I've been praying for my parents to start talking to each other and to forgive one another and to at least be civil to each other. And it's been years that I have been praying for this. I don't think God hears me. I don't, I, I don't think God hears me, I said. I want to give up. I, should I, I don't know what to do. And he, he looked at me and he said, Persevere. Keep praying. And then he said, Our session is over. <laughs> Go. Keep praying. Persevere. Well, the culmination of all of this happened uh, when Bishop Walsh, who was the first bishop of Las Vegas, he was, he's the one who ordained me as a priest. He called me and he said, uh, I'm going to be ordaining you a priest on such and such a day. Uh, and I, I was, of course, I was ecstatic. I didn't... Uh, I, I said, oh, thank you so much. I put the phone down. I was I'm jumping up and down. You know, I said, finally, no more seminary food. You know, uh, no more, no more. And of course, after I got off the phone with the bishop, the first thing I did was I called my mother. Which is natural, isn't it? To call your mom. And I said to her, I said, mom, the bishop just called me. And he said that he's going to ordain me on such and such a day. It would be wonderful if you could come. And the first thing out of her mouth wasn't, Oh, it's so wonderful that you will be ordained a priest. It's so wonderful that, you know, after all these years, your time is coming to a, to a, to a close in the seminary. No. The first thing out of her mouth was, is your father going to be there? Is your father going to be there? Because if he's going, I'm not. If he's going, I'm not. And the same thing happened when I called my father. I said, you know, um, the bishop just called and said he's going to ordain me a priest on such and such a day. It'd be wonderful if you came. And he said the same thing. 
Is your mother going to be there? Except he didn't say your mother. He said some other words. I can't say that. But, you know, obviously. You know what that's like in your own life. You know? Now, my parents obviously love me. I know that. They love me. But their hate for one another blinded them as animosity and hate and feelings of revenge and grudges. They blind us. They enslave us. They ensnare us. But I talked to the rector, you know, and I said to the, the rector is the priest that's in charge of the seminary, and I told him my dilemma. I said, I don't know, I, I'm not going to have my parents here because they're not going to come. One doesn't want to come if the other one is here. And he said, don't worry. We'll put one on one end of the chapel and one on the other end of the chapel. Don't worry. We'll make this work. And so they came and they were sitting on opposite ends of the chapel. And this is, the ordination is a, is a mass. It's a mass that uh, we have to ordain priests. And at each and every Mass, what happens? Peace. We have the sign of peace. We have the moment when the priest says, Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace is my gift to you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your Church, and graciously grant us that peace and that unity of your Kingdom, where you live and reign forever and ever, Amen. And that's what the bishop said. And then he said, The peace of the Lord be with you always. And everybody said, And with your spirit. And then he said, And now let us exchange the sign of peace with one another. And I was watching this, and this was a miracle that I was waiting for in my whole life. The one miracle I was praying for. My father left his side of the chapel and went over to my mom and said, Peace be with you. And I was watching this. Peace be with you. I was praying for this throughout my entire time in the seminary, from the day I entered. And when did God answer my prayers? The very last day. The day I finished the seminary. God answered my prayers, as God answers each and every one of our prayers. So whatever it is that you are praying for in your life, whatever miracle it is that you are seeking, God hears you. God hears you. God hears you and God will answer you. Persevere. Do not give up. God is with us and God hears us. And so let's pray right now. Let's bring this and this time that we have spent with the Lord. And let's reflect on God's abiding presence here with us. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I lack. In green pastures, he lets me graze. To safe waters, he leads me. He restores my strength. He guides me along the right path for the sake of his name. Even though I may walk through the dark valley, I will fear no harm. I will fear no evil, for God is at my side. His rod and His staff give me courage. He has set a table before me as my enemies watch. He has anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Only goodness and love will pursue me all the days of my life as I dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And Lord, as we come to You today, we come with heavy hearts, burdened hearts, whatever it is that we are feeling. We implore your mercy today for ourselves, for the times that we have wronged you, 
for the times that we have failed to be messengers of mercy to those around us. And we ask you to help us make the changes necessary to be beacons of light and love and forgiveness to a very hungry world. And we bring to you now all of our loved ones and friends and those that we wish to commend to your mercy today as we pray for them and as we glorify you now and forever by saying glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now let us pray as we bless our food. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, we ask you to bless our food, bless this nourishment that we will receive, and in a special way we pray for all those who are not able to enjoy such a luscious meal as we will. These, all the people who go hungry day after day, we ask your forgiveness for wasting food, for throwing food away, for eating too much, and we always ask you to give us hunger for you and for your word. In your name we pray, amen. amen. As we say, bless us, O Lord, in these thy gifts, which we are about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay. We're going to break for lunch. Though. Extra books. So if you can't get your own, don't worry. Just talk to me. You know, we're all one big happy family. So uh, I'll be happy to uh, let, you have a, let you have it. Um, again, save your questions for the end. Uh, because if... If, um, if you ask me questions during, you're getting me off track. So, uh, so write your questions down and save them, okay? And we'll be, if we have time at the end, we will answer the questions. And uh, the questions will not be recorded, okay? Because inevitably someone might ask something that I don't want to be. Uh, so... Uh, so we'll stop the recording and then we will uh, have questions because maybe you have some personal questions that you might want to have. Since I hear you can share things because there's nobody here that gossips. And so... <laughs> 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 nobody's going to nobody's going to post it on Facebook, okay? So... Uh, anyway, so let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord, we thank you for this nourishing lunch. Thank you for the food. And now we ask you to continue to nourish our souls as we contemplate your word, your presence in our lives, and your call to be your disciples. And we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. You give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And so we have been talking about God's forgiveness in our lives, God's mercy, God's presence in our lives. Uh, recent events in the church have pointed out to us how weak all of us are as people, all of us, no matter whether we are consecrated, whether we are ordained, all of us are weak people because we are human beings. There are many within the church 
who are on a crusade to cleanse the church, to have the church more pure or uh, have the church more perfect. They want to remove the weeds, in other words, from the wheat. But when we do that, we play God. That's not our job. So, one of the things that really gets me is the, the people who say, well, Father, so-and-so should not be receiving communion because uh, they are living in this way or they are doing this or they are doing that. Or, did you know about this? They shouldn't be doing that. Uh, when we are in church, before we receive communion, what do we say? Right after the priest lifts up the host and says, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold Him who takes away the sins of the world. How blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. What do we say? Let's say that together. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and I shall. Okay, well, some people, and you know, say they don't say lord i am not worthy they say lord my neighbor's not worthy to receive you but only say the word uh, that's a that is a reflection for us to make you know am i constantly looking at others to see how they are unworthy none of us is worthy none of us is worthy but it's God who makes us worthy because of God's great love for us. And so our work is to be reconcilers, to be people of forgiveness. And the best and most effective way to do that is by being gentle. By, you see, Paul says in the Bible, he says, I am the least of the apostles. I am not worthy to be called an apostle. Do you think of yourself as better than someone else? Do you think you're better than the prisoner in prison who has murdered lots and lots of people and raped lots of people? Do you think you're better? Do you think you're better than the woman who has had an abortion? Do you think you're better than the person who has committed adultery? Do you think you're better than the person who has AIDS or another debilitating disease? Do you, do you think of yourself as better in any way because of your economic status, your social status? No one, not one of us is better than anyone else. It's very hard for us to internalize that, especially thinking that I'm not better than the person who has committed all of these acts of violence? How could that be? And how could they deserve God's mercy? And not just God's mercy, but my mercy. This was very apparent when I was uh, in my previous parish. And as part of the parish, we had a maximum security state prison that housed some 3,000 inmates. And the prison is called Pelican Bay State Prison. It's one of the most notorious ones around the country, and it houses the prisoners who cannot make it in other prisons. So in order to get there, you'd have to commit a crime inside of the prison system. So it's not that you've murdered someone, but that you've done acts of violence inside of the prison. And this is the prison that was in the town I was at. And I would go to that prison and visit the prisoners there visit the inmates and it was not difficult you, people said oh that's it must be difficult to deal with the inmates no, it was absolutely joyful I loved it it brought me a great sense of uh, solace and and comfort that I was able to minister to them and to be present to them it wasn't hard to deal 
with the inmates. The people that it was hard to deal with were the prison guards or the corrections officers, as they are called, because they did not see the people there, many of them, I should say, not all the prison uh, guards, but many of the prison guards did not see the prisoners as worthy of my time and attention because they thought of themselves as better. They would say, Father, don't you know what they have done? I have access to their files. I could tell you what they have done because many of them were members of the parish. And I was the pastor of a church and in our, in our parish we had uh, the families and the corrections officers and so I knew them from, from our parish and they would say, don't you know, you, you, I should tell you what they have done. And there is that underlying sense that somehow I am better. And not one of us is better than anyone else. In God's eyes, we are all equal. All of us. No matter our background, our economic status, no matter what we have done, we are all His children. All of us are God's children. And we are called to have that same attitude, to work on having that same attitude in our life. But when I think of myself as better, I can't, I can't change. And so, as Paul says, I am the least. And so how is it that you see yourself? You know, do you see, do you see, do you see yourself as less than? Or do you see yourself as more than? Do you see yourself as better? In any way, we are to think of ourselves as less. Lord, let me decrease so that you may increase. Let God increase and you have to decrease. Jesus, meek and humble of heart, make my heart like yours. Meek and humble of heart. Jesus was meek and humble. And he's calling us to do the same in our life. This is the example that I gave all of you today, a picture of Pope John Paul II, who is a saint now in the church. And Pope John Paul II is from where? Does anybody know? Poland. Okay, you better know that. Okay. You better know that. And Pope John Paul II was a bishop, was a bishop uh, in, in Poland. Uh, well, he was born in Poland. He was born in 1920. And he was uh, a bishop in the time of Poland during great turmoil. Great turmoil. Uh, he was born in 1920 and he lived through the period of World War II. World War II began on September 1st, 1939, when the Nazis or Germany invaded Poland and took over Poland. And then they set up concentration camps in Poland. And in concentration camps, it wasn't just Jews that died in concentration camps, but originally the concentration camps, such as the most famous one, Auschwitz-Birkenau, was set up for Polish political prisoners. It was set up for Poles. And so the original people who perished in the concentration camp en masse were Poles. And so this is what the Nazis set up in Poland. And Pope John Paul II lived through this. He lived through great persecution. In fact, he didn't even go to the seminary as we would know it. He had, all, the, all the seminaries in Poland were closed during World War II. The Nazis closed all schools, all universities. Everything was closed because the eventual plan was to exterminate the Polish people because they, they, they were just going to have a pure race. And so they started with Jews and they were going to progress on down. And so all the schools were closed and John Paul II attended a seminary in a clandestine way, so in hiding in the palace or the residence of the Archbishop of Krakow, uh, the Archbishop of Krakow, Poland, and uh, he was then ordained in 1946, and this was right after World War II, and so the Polish people were feeling hurt 
as you can understandably feel when somebody has done that to you, when they invade your country, take it over, set up concentration camps. Uh, the capital of Poland, Warsaw, was 85% destroyed, 80, I mean leveled. Hitler was going to put a lake there in the capital. Krakow wasn't destroyed because he uh, liked the architecture there and so he saved it. But anyway, what I'm getting at, can you imagine the deep suffering that Pope John Paul II is living under and he then becomes a bishop in 1958. And one of the first acts he does when he became a bishop is he sees the deep hurt in the people. He sees how deep hurt the people are by what has transpired during World War II. And after he becomes a bishop, his first act is to, on behalf of the Polish people, write a letter to the German people. And in the letter, he writes this. We ask for your forgiveness. We, the Polish people, ask for your forgiveness and we forgive you. We ask for your forgiveness and we forgive you. This was outrageous. It outraged lots of people in Poland, particularly the communist authorities, that then used this and say, see, this is the church. They want to subjugate you. This is, this is your church. This is how they are. Look what they're doing. This is because, what did he write again? We ask for your forgiveness. Now, you think to yourself, is he nuts? Forgiveness for what? What did the Poles do to the Germans during World War II? The Poles weren't the ones who invaded, set up concentration camps, bombed most cities, leveled the capital. They didn't do that. And yet, He's saying, we ask for your forgiveness? That's, it doesn't make any sense unless you look at it from the standpoint of Christianity. We ask for your forgiveness. Humility, in other words. Isn't that what Jesus did from the cross? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do in your own life, you may not know why it is that whoever you are estranged from, whoever you know, has wronged you, whoever you feel that has done bad things to you, you may not know why it is that you should be the one who should reach out to them because you're saying to yourself, well, why should I? They are the ones who did this, this, and this, and this to me. But that's where humility sets in. The example of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who gave His life. You should be the one to make the first step and seek forgiveness. We turn the other cheek, in other words. We pray for our enemies. We pray for those who persecute us. We are supposed to be different. In other words, if we are going to be the same, if we are going to love those who love us, what's so different about us? There's nothing different about us if we love the people who love us, because that's easy to do. Love those who love you. But we are to love those who hurt us, who inflict pain on us, who have wronged us, who've done terrible things to us. That's different. That's hard to do. That's hard to do. And that is the call of Jesus in our life. And that is the example that St. John Paul II taught us. Over and over again, he would seek forgiveness as Pope. He would ask for forgiveness. Ask forgiveness of these people, of those people. Ask forgiveness all the time. And is asking us to do likewise in our life as well. To seek forgiveness from those that may have wronged us. And in that, bring peace into our lives. We are right now in the time 
of the church that we call Lent. 40 days in the desert. We are in the desert right now. And the desert is not a place of lush green trees with shaded canopies, rivers, and abundant wildlife. It's not the desert. We are talking here about a holy land. The holy land, Judea. It's a desert, a desolate stretch of sun-scorched earth. Much like what we see here during the summer. That's the desert. Jesus entered the desert experience. He entered the desert experience after he was baptized. You have in the desert barren mountains and dusty rocky soil. All of it bleached the color of bones. And Jesus enters the desert and makes it holy. He sanctifies it. We too are in our own desert experience. Remember, Jesus enters the desert right after he's baptized in the Jordan. You and I have been baptized, and now I have news for all of you, I know. Welcome to the desert. <laughs> Welcome to the desert. We are in the desert. And that is why we have a liturgical calendar in the church. We go through different seasons in the church to remind us of how our life is. It's not all Easter or Christmas. And it's not all ordinary, meaning just things going regular, you know, just fine. There is the desert there too. The desert is part of our life. Just because you are baptized doesn't mean it's all going to be Christmas and Easter and things going nice and fine and regular. No, you're going to have the desert as well, just like Jesus did. So we too are in our own desert here in this life. And the desert symbolizes the problems and the tribulations of this life. It symbolizes our depression, our loneliness, and in many ways, our inability to forgive or to seek forgiveness or to bring forgiveness to others or to believe. In effect, the desert symbolizes the cry, the cry from the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. My God, why have you abandoned me? Now, in the desert, when Jesus is in the desert and the devil is tempting him, the Bible says the devil then leaves him for a time. It's like that in our life. You know, we go through our desert experiences and we get out of one desert experience and then another one sets in. The devil comes with his temptations again and again. And what is the greatest temptation of the devil? To feel alone, that I feel like I am by myself, that God is not with me. That's the other desert experience of Jesus, the most profound experience of Jesus on the cross. My God, where are you? I'm going through this or that. Where are you? Come and rescue me. Why have you abandoned me? That is the temptation of the devil, to make us feel like we are alone, like there is no God. So, don't be afraid of your emotions. Don't be afraid to face your emotions as Jesus did. He faced his emotions. Remember, Jesus was sinless. He had no sin. So the fact that he felt the way he did, that he felt abandoned, that's a normal thing. You have to be real with God in your own walk and in your own journey. And so it's okay to say, Lord, you know, I don't know. I, I just, I'm having a hard time. There's nothing wrong with that. To be honest with God in our prayer life. To tell Him, you know, I just don't feel you right now. I, I'm, God wants us to be honest in our walk with Him. To talk to Him honestly. And there is nothing wrong with feeling the abandonment. One of the great experiences, one of the great experiences of the desert 
in modern times is recounted to us by Mother Teresa of Calcutta, who will be canonized this year. She's going to be a saint in September. All of us remember uh, Mother Teresa of Calcutta. And she's a great example of faith, is she not? She's a great example of somebody who was faithful to God, who put her great faith into action, who served, who lived a selfless life. We would all say that. But Mother Teresa, as we have found out, because before somebody is declared officially a saint, canonized by the church, their life is examined, Mother Teresa experienced for most of her life, we're talking like 99.9% .9 of her life, her earthly existence here on earth, she experienced the desert so profoundly that there were great times where she would even cease to pray. She addressed Jesus in her prayer as the great absent one, the one who isn't there. And yet, every single day, she would pray for one hour before she would start her day. And most of what she did there, she recounts, is she would just sit there. And most of the time she would feel like God wasn't there. And so she would address Jesus. She'd say, the great absent one, the one who isn't with me. Do you, can you imagine Mother Teresa feeling abandoned by God, feeling like God wasn't there, feeling like God wasn't real? Mother Teresa. And if she had that, she had the desert experience for most of her life, what makes us think that we won't? Mother Teresa had that. And monks and mystics have always sought out the desert as a holy place. As a very holy place. And the desert, that great experience of God not being there. And so when you feel like God's not answering you, when you feel overwhelmed by the problems of life, whatever they may be, you know, maybe your own sickness or the sickness or disease of a family member or the lo loss of a family member, you know, somebody dies in your life. The desert comes and you feel like, you know, how, how could you allow this, God? I can't believe you have allowed this. Or employment issues, depression, addictions, all sorts of things. When those times set in, it's a normal part of this life. It's normal, completely normal. In fact, most of our life is the desert. If you look at the church's calendar, Lent is 40 days. It's long. It's a long period. And then when the Bible talks about 40 days in the desert, it also talks about the exile of the Israelites that was 40 years. And we don't take the Bible literally. We take it seriously. And in the Bible, when it talks about years or days, it just means it's a long time. So this desert experience, this abandonment, is a long experience in our life. It's a prolonged experience. And you know that from your own life. You know, you, we have these up experiences where, oh my gosh, I feel you, Lord, so much. Thank you. And then something happens and boom, you know. And what happens? Most people give up. How many people stop going to church? You know, you know, in recent years, how many people have stopped going to church because of the clergy abuse scandal that has happened and rocked the church, and they stop going to church. They just give up. Or that some pastor or priest stole money, and then they stop going to church. Or somebody's hurt them, said something bad to them, and they stop going to church. Or other people give up. You know, I've been praying for my family member or someone to get cured from cancer and they died 
He doesn't listen to me. He doesn't hear me. And they give up. All sorts of ways that the devil tries to work on us in the desert experience to make us feel like God's not there, God isn't real. And that's what happens. We give up. So many people give up. You see how many people have given up on church, have given up on faith. Perseverance, it's a very hard thing. Mother Teresa, even though for most of her life, she experienced the abandonment of God, calling Jesus the great absent one. That was her name for Jesus, the great absent one for most of her life. She did something that I've been trying to point out to you today. That's why I passed out the picture of Jesus, the divine mercy to all of you. She did something that all of us are called to do in this life. And that is she trusted. She trusted. Our life with God isn't about believing in God. Anybody can believe in God. You know, uh, the devil believes in God. The devil's a great believer. The devil knows God exists. The devil can pray the creed. Say it. I believe in God because the devil knows God is real. But the devil doesn't trust. The devil trusts his own abilities. His own... His own power. We are to trust in the power of God. It's not I who live, the Bible says, but it's Christ who lives in me. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In our baptism, it's not me, it's me and Jesus. Alone, I can't do it. But through Him who strengthens me, that's again the Bible, through Him who strengthens me, I can do all things. Through Him who strengthens me. That's why I'm called to trust. In the midst of the desert, in the midst of the abandonment, to say, you know, Lord, I don't know why the things that are in my life that are happening are happening. I don't know. I don't understand. That's okay. You don't have to understand. The smartest person that ever lived on earth, okay, Socrates, the great philosopher, he said something. He said, the only thing I know is that I know nothing. The only thing I know is that I know nothing. You think you know so much? We know so very little. And we know so very little about God. God is the great unknown that we are asked to trust. We know so very little. The, the, the Bible says, you know, that's why it's not just the Bible that we have to go by, but our own experiences, our conscience, our feelings of faith, uh, our prayer experience, uh, the experience of the church, the 2,000 years of tradition, because the Bible itself says all the books in the world would not be enough to contain all that Jesus said and did. But these are written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. All the books in the world are not enough. Our, we know so very little about God. And yet we are asked to trust in this great unknown. I know not why, but I trust the desert. So the question here is for us. Do I embrace the desert? Do I embrace the desert or do I run from it? I have to embrace the desert. People today run from their desert. People run to all sorts of things. The desert, you know, is our problems, our sufferings, our, our issues. You know, my inability to forgive. Uh, the fact that I've been hurt, whatever. People run. So is, it, is that what I do? Do I run? Do I run to the bottle, to drugs, to pain medicine? Do I run to the casino? People run to religion. They have, everything in their life is religion. False security. Right? 
Do I run away from the desert or do I face the desert? Do I face the desert experience? I have the issues I have. So what? Everybody's got issues. You know, it's like when, when the person comes to me and says, Father, Adam, I have all of these problems. I have all of these sufferings. <gasps> I don't know what to do. I don't know. I have all these uh, obstacles, all these things. I don't know. You know what I say to the person? I say, welcome to the club. <laughs> Welcome to the club. It's called being alive. Everybody's got issues. And so do you. So you can either run away from them or face them. And encounter God within your issues. In your issues. It's in the desert that we encounter God. It's in the desert that Jesus encountered God. It's in the desert that we will encounter God. Did the Israelites not meet God in the desert? Who answered all their needs? And so, the... And I'm going to speak for myself here, but you know, when we are in the desert, the loudest voice working against me is my own. So many times. That's why we are our own worst enemies. We are. You know, you think your enemies are those on the outside. The enemies are on the inside of you. You work against yourself. You tell yourself, you know, you're not good enough. You're this. You can't do it. You won't be able to make it. You know, it was those times that I beat up myself and told myself all kinds of lies about how I wasn't good enough, worthy enough, talented enough, loving enough, and how I simply wasn't enough when we are in the desert. And God comes to us in the desert of our lives and says, you are enough because you are mine. You are enough because you are mine. That's the great temptation, really, that we will believe the lies of the devil and his greatest lie is to make us think we are alone. The devil wants you to think that you are something other than the beloved son and daughter of God. And so this is what Lent is about. That God is in the midst of our desert with us. Not to fix us. God's not here to fix you. You're always going to be a broken person. Always wounded person. Think of this, when Jesus comes back when after the resurrection, so he rises from the dead, when he comes back, whenever he comes back, does he come back with his wounds healed? No, they're always exposed. That's why he says to Thomas, put your finger in here and into my side, put your finger in here, because he shows up with his wounds exposed. That's why we live, in, we live life wounded, we have wounds. And I have news for some of you. Some wounds never heal. Some wounds never really heal. Some wounds will never heal until you're gone from here. And you work through those wounds. If you've been raped, for example, some of the, it's, that wound may never really heal. And, uh, you know, uh, somebody who has had an abortion, you know, that wound is always there. Always. It's, I mean, there are wounds in our life that will never heal, as Jesus' wounds did not heal. They didn't. And God's not in our life to fix us. God's in our life to be with us, to accompany us, to walk with us. That's why on the road to Emmaus, when Jesus comes and joins, and they're all sad on the road to Emmaus, if you know from the Bible. That's why you should be reading the Bible. And if you're not reading the Bible, that's a big mistake. The church produced the Bible for us and gave us the Bible to nourish us to feed us, to help us. And so we get, I mean, ignorance of the Bible is ignorance of Jesus. How can you get to know in it? 
You know, how can you have a relationship with somebody you don't know? I love you, Jesus, but I know nothing about you. You get to know Jesus from the Bible. That's why we read it. And on the road to Emmaus, which is a very powerful story, Jesus joins the disciples there on the road to Emmaus. And they're sad because Jesus had just died. They're sad. And he comes and he walks with them on the road. And he comforts them. The road to Emmaus is indicative of our own road. This life is a journey. It's a pilgrimage we are on. It's all a journey. And God's walking there on that road with us to accompany us and to be with us. He's not here to fix us. The key to our happiness in the desert as Christians is that we are not alone in the desert. We are not alone. And so you and I take our identity from being children of God, God's beloved sons and daughters. One of the things that I really enjoy doing as a priest is visiting people who are in nursing homes. And on one of my visits, I always visit people who are in nursing homes. Part of the nursing home experience is they have the memory care unit in the nursing homes. And I never know from one time to the next in the nursing home whether the people there know who I am. And so before I engage them in conversation, I always ask them, do you know who I am? I say, do you know who I am? And then when they tell me if they do or not, uh, if not, I tell them. Well, I asked this one lady in the memory care unit. I said to her, I said, do you know who I am? I said, do you know who I am? And she looked at me, she says, no. But if you ask at the front desk, they will tell you. <laughs> no, I don't. Go to the front desk, they'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, this question is a good one for all of us. Do I know who I am? If I am the beloved child of God, and God doesn't have grandchildren, God doesn't have nieces, God doesn't have nephews, God doesn't have stepchildren, no red-haired stepchildren, okay? God only has children. You and I are children of God. Does the Bible say God has grandchildren? No! God only has children. We are sons and daughters of God. And if you and I are beloved sons and daughters of God, when a child is scared in the midst of the darkness of the night, and in our life, you know, so much of our life is darkness. The darkness is, is symbolized by the problems, the issues, and all of that. And think of it. When you were a child, and you got scared in the middle of the night, or when your kids, a lot of you have children, when your kids got scared in the middle of the night, for whatever reason, what did you do? You ran to the bedroom of the parent. You ran to your parents' bedroom or your kids came running to your bedroom. Did they not? Did they not? They run to the bedroom for shelter and comfort. Now, the, does, the, does the parent have the power to uh, open the child up and uh, take them out of the darkness? No, the darkness is still there. Or do, you, do, you, do the parents turn the light on and then everybody sleeps in the, in, the, in, the, in the lighted bedroom? No! It's still dark. Is it not in the room? It's still dark. But the child is comforted by the presence of the parent in the bedroom. Their mother or father is there. And that's what brings them comfort. That's what brings them shelter in the the midst of the darkness. This is what we do as well in the midst of our own dark night. And St. John of the Cross, who's a very powerful saint, and he describes this dark night of the soul, that our souls go through these dark nights when we experience the absence of God. And when we go through that, in the midst of our own dark night, he calls this that, St. John of the Cross. Uh, he's one of the doctors of the church, which means he, he has produced some fabulous works 
and contributed to the understanding of spirituality of our walk with God and he says in the midst of the dark night that we experience we are to run to our father we run to our father and the father comforts us there and shelters us in the midst of the darkness so run to God in the midst of your darkness run to him it's and, and you know and this this is a big problem that we have as people because it's not enough for us that God is there in the darkness it's not enough we want God to remove us from the darkness it was the same experience for Peter and the Apostles my favorite story in the Bible is when Jesus is in the boat with Peter and the others they're in the boat and there is a storm raging on all around them a big storm there's a storm raging and they're in the boat now the church is the boat is it not okay so think of this you need to think figuratively now here when you're reading the the Bible you got to place yourself in there you have to place yourself there and so Jesus is in the boat and what is Jesus doing Jesus is asleep he's sleeping is he not what does the parent do in the bedroom when the child runs in there the parent sleeps okay now you, you, you are you get, I hope you're getting a lot of this okay so I hope you're having some aha moments of grace when God is speaking to you right now Jesus is asleep in the boat and there is a big storm raging and Peter is afraid now the storms of course are the storms of our life whatever storms we have to go through you know marital issues sickness not being able to pay your bills you know whatever they whatever those storms are depression anxiety all sorts of things we all have the storms in our life and the storm is raging and Jesus is sleeping and Peter is afraid and he wakes Jesus up and he says Jesus don't you care don't you care about us wake up we're perishing here we're drowning the storms are overwhelming us the boat is being filled with water get up get up Jesus and Jesus rebukes Peter and says oh ye of little faith oh ye of little faith oh ye of little faith and he calmed the storm of course but he says isn't it enough in other words it's not enough that I'm here with you you're gonna be fine I'm here with you isn't it enough and no it's not and Peter is representative of all of us because it's also in our life that's true as well it's not enough that Jesus is in the boat with us now, the, the, the church is the boat we are the church you get it right it's not enough that Jesus is in the boat we want him to calm the storm we want him to calm the storm and he doesn't come to do that in our life that's not why God enters our life God doesn't doesn't come to calm the storm God comes to be with you in the midst of the storm he's your parent he's with you he's your father you're his child you'll be fine God's with you so the the great the great task for our life as followers of Jesus is not to live waiting for the storm to pass because you're always going to be in the midst of storms one storm passes another one arrives that's not how we are to live we don't live waiting for the storm to pass we live learning to dance in the rain we live 
learning to dance in the rain. The storm may be raging, but God's with me. I'm going to be fine. That's how I can dance in the rain. Because God's with me. And if God is with me, the Bible says, who can be against me? Who can be against me? If God is with me, who can be against me? Now, when I entered the seminary, that was the big sign on top of the door of the seminary. Si Deus nobiscum quis contra nos. Which is Latin for, if God with us, who can be against us? And that's quoting the Bible. If God is with me, who can be against me? In other words, Paul puts it another way. What can separate me from the love of God? What? If I know that I am loved and that God loves me, if I feel it, and we have experienced the love of God in our life, if I know that God loves me, what can separate me from the love of God? Can trial or tribulation or the sword, in other words, if they, if they cut me up, can that do it? No. Can sickness or disease? No. What about the, the powers of this world? So some political powers, can they separate me from the love of God? No. What about the evil powers of the world? of the evil world. Can they do something to me? No! I am with Jesus. I am His. He is mine. Nothing can separate me from the love of God, says Paul in the Bible. Not even death itself. Nothing. Not even death. If Jesus has taken care of everything, in other words, He says, you know, wherever you are, I've been there before. And I've taken care of everything. I've taken care of it. Wherever you are, I've been there before. I've taken care of it and I will take care of you now, whatever it is that you're going through. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not even death itself. Everything and anything that we can think of that could separate us from God has been destroyed by the love of His Son, Jesus Christ. And so what is it that we are to do? Run into the loving embrace of our Father, who is waiting there to embrace us, to welcome us, and to reassure us that we are His and He is ours, that He loves us, He is with us, and He will always be with us. And if God is with us, we will be okay. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank You for this time together that we have spent We ask you to continue to work in our lives, to mold us, to shape us, and to instill in us your great presence. And as we declare you and make you our Lord, our Master, we want you to help us so that we could dance in the rain And as we glorify you now and always, we say glory be to the Father and to the Son. And to the Holy Spirit. As it as was, was in the beginning, it is now, now and ever shall be. World, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.